that uh, started back up again. Welcome back. I hope that uh, New York provisioned you well on a food front. Um, I've been programming for a very long time. I started out in the late 70s as a guy who actually did hand-assembled code on an 88 on an old MSI uh, S100 bus computer. I progressed from there to C and C++, and I live now mostly in C Sharp. And, and because I be also had an academic career, i aware of functional programming for a very long time, you know, probably since the mid-80s or something like that. And it's always seemed interesting but not relevant to me as a, a practicing uh, developer. And one of the interesting things about using C Sharp with Link is that over the past couple of years, I've transitioned to doing a whole lot more functional programming. And so it's, for me at least, uh, it, that functional stuff, which has always been sitting out there, is, is starting to enter in the practical realm. And so the stuff that Toby is going to talk about today is actually super interesting to me because of the idea that functional programming now has got to the point where we can actually use it on the back end for doing stuff. So, All right. Thanks, Terry. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, Toby, here from Hootsuite, uh, and yeah, I'm going to talk about, uh, I originally called the talk APIs with Scala and Play, but that was kind of inaccurate, so really I'm talking about microservices with Scala and Play. Sorry if anyone traveled all this way to learn about APIs. Uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone did. So yeah, what am I talking about? Well, basically, I'm trying to make a case here. That's all I'm doing. I'm trying to make a case that Building microservices when you want to build a new feature is really easy now. Um, I'm going to demonstrate one way you might go around about doing that. Um, and yeah, just try to convince you in general that you know if you have an application, an existing application, uh, whether it's consumer facing and high load like Facebook, right, or uh, even an enterprise app, when it comes to trying to add a new feature, wedging functionality into existing code may not even be the path of least, least resistance anymore. It might be just as easy or even easier to spin up an entirely new microservice and then gain all the benefits from that. Uh, so just briefly to qualify everything, what this talk is not about. Um, I am using Scala and Play here, but I'm not necessarily arguing that they're the best choice. They're obviously one of many. Um, and depending on your use case, you may not. Even at Hootsuite, we use Scala heavily uh, for our services, but we don't necessarily use the Play framework as I'm going to demonstrate it here. Uh, we stripped it down because, you know, we want better performance. Um, Spray is another good option if you're using Scala. Python and Flask, I'm sure, will get the job done. Um, and whatever you happen to be familiar with, I'm sure will work. I'm not really doing anything according to best practices. Uh, I am trying to roll out an entire service here in under an hour, so I'm cutting corners where necessary. But uh, hopefully that's kept to a minimum. And I'm not doing like a hard sell on, hey, you should build everything in micro uh, sorry, in a service-oriented architecture. Um, I actually think you probably should, but I don't have enough time. That's probably like a one-hour talk in and of itself that I don't really necessarily want to go through. Um, so I'll leave that to your choice once you see kind of what's possible here. Um, out of curiosity, who here works on a service-oriented architecture? Build yeah, quite a few people. Um, Great. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you've seen some benefits. Um, also aware of potential drawbacks. Uh, they do exist. All right. So just to sort of give some context to a lot of that terminology, uh, I want to first talk about, I'm, I'm going to refer here to a monolithic back end. Uh, and what this is, is you know, how I kind of came into working with this stuff and understanding these concepts was I, I joined Hootsuite and we had what I would call a monolithic back end. So you know, our, our users are out there. They interact with our app. <laughs> The app hits an API on the back end. This is a simplified version. But then you have this one giant code base. For us, it was a PHP code base. For a lot of people, it's Rails or something else. Oh, sorry, Ruby, something else. Um, and you know, you've cohered to perfectly to the MVC, you know, sort of model here. You've got your API controllers. Uh, when requests come in there, they filter through your business logic, and you use a single data access layer that kind of hides your data store behind that. Um, and I just expect that's what many people here work with on a regular basis, right? Uh, even if you are starting to move towards microservices and stuff, that's still generally your main product because that works well. You know, when you want to build your initial product, you do something simple and then it grows and grows and the company's growing faster Then you can build great software and next thing you know, you've got this monolithic thing with a lot of logic and complexity. Some of the drawbacks to that, um, 
scaling is hard. If you do start getting traffic and volume, if it is a consumer facing app, uh, or you know you need to handle lots of data and whatnot, you're going to start running into difficulties with scaling. Um, scaling horizontally is difficult. So if you have many, you know, what we usually do is we start deploying many uh, instances of uh, a web front end, I guess, which is each of which is running that app. But then you have a single data store to keep your data consistent, right? And then you have caching and caching validation concerns. It's not impossible, but it is difficult. Um, code gets harder to reason about, right? Things start getting coupled inadvertently, but even if they don't, you've got a lot going on in there. And so trying to reason through your code, uh, particularly if it's not a compiled language uh, or something that can be, you know, inferred strongly, um, but just in general. Obviously, as this thing builds up, has lots more features, it's going to be difficult. Uh, and finally, it basically forces you usually into all or nothing deploys, right? You want to make one little tweak, you want to add one little feature, you got to push out your entire code stack. Um, that introduces things, because you're also going to find it's harder to test. You can't necessarily black box test, black box test an entire system um, effectively and fast, anything like that. So you get reliability and other issues there. So that's fine. So what's my solution? Well, all I'm saying here is you've got a new feature, and I'll give you a concrete example. That's going to be the rest of the talk. Um, but you've got a new feature. All I'm saying is instead of wedging that into your existing code base, why not build it as a microservice on the side? A microservice being effectively a self-contained independent application. Um, and so what's kind of being described with the arrows here is the user who's using your client, or maybe that's your JavaScript front end or whatever that is, um, that's still going to connect to the API on your main application. Um, but that's essentially, in, for this new feature, if they have to hit an endpoint that relates to the new feature, is effectively just going to be a thin facade. It'll maybe handle authenticating the user, anything like that, um, but then it'll just pass the request through the microservice. The microservice has its own API controller, um, its own business logic, and obviously a data access layer, and it stores persist data in its own data store. Uh, it's completely separate. Um, what the gray lines here are representing, the slightly lighter ones, is often a feature does not operate in a vacuum. It may need data from your main application. That's fine, you know, the pre-existing data. But it's going to try and read those through the API instead of introducing more coupling than necessary. And likewise, if some other, feature, some other aspect of your main application requires that data about that feature, it again is going to go through the API. So what we're doing here is we're actually introducing a sense of decoupling. Um, major benefits to just spinning this up in a microservice, well, first you get the privilege of focusing on an application that does exactly one thing and does it very well. Uh, that means you're going to design better, you're going to be able, code's going to be able to be as efficient as you need, um, and it naturally encourages decoupling, uh, which is something we always strive for, but once you start bundling code together and shipping it all together, those lines get blurry and sometimes we cut corners to our own future detriment. Um, and a nice great benefit is it's a low friction. It you know, it makes it lower friction to reuse components, which is becoming more and more important. Uh, for anyone who's at a company that's growing, uh, something I see a lot in any sort, of, particularly in enterprise-facing products, but really in any product, is you build your one product, your company grows, but then, you know, CEOs or the board of directors, they get eager and they want to make lots more money. Well, how do you do that? You start introducing more products that, you know, um, share a feature set but target different verticals or different customer bases, things like that. So, you, oh, that's not helpful. Um, so, yeah, you basically get to just benefit from that. So, you know, if you look here, you could imagine that you might have multiple of these large products all interacting with that one microservice, sharing data, sharing the features, um, but without necessarily having to share the code because it's running independently. All right. So, what's our scenario for today? Um, imagine, if you will, <laughs> that we have an app. It's a simple app, it's one of these consumer phone apps, and it just helps people find a fitness studio near them. Doesn't matter. You want a yoga class, you can find a yoga class. None of that actually matters. What we're going to do is we're going to add the feature for a person to favorite a studio. Pretty simple. Um, hopefully that kind of makes sense to you. You know, just hit the star on your app or whatever and it's favorited. Um, and we're going to build a new feature, uh, this new feature as a microservice, just to sort of demonstrate what we can do. So what I'm going to try and cover is building uh, starting initializing a service, I guess you could say, that exposes a, a HTTP REST API um, that works with JSON, persists data to MySQL, handles caching internally, because you want to handle that inside of your microservice, and I'll just briefly introduce you to ACA actors for handling some uh, concurrent tasks cleanly. 
and consuming external web services, uh, HTTP in this case. Oh, sorry. All right, so chapter zero. Uh, so how do we get a new service started? Well, with play, uh, or in this case, it's using what's called activator, but some confusing terminology there. But basically, you do it in a couple or in one line, really. Uh, so if you want to install this activator on, like, it's, it's called TypeSafe Activator. It's what you'll be prompted to download if you Google the Play Framework. Uh, go to PlayFramework.com. If you have a Mac, you can use Brew Install TypeSafe Activator. Um, so yeah, with one simple command, we can create the skeleton for our new service. Um, top one there, Activator New. Favorite service. The play Scala is identifying a template. That's optional. Otherwise, it'll present you with a list of templates. Um, and then that just runs, you know, downloads some dependencies off the line and what, off the internet, sorry, um, and uh, sets it all up and sets up a skeleton. And then you can just run that with activator run. And to demonstrate what you get, so the internet's a bit shoddy here, so this isn't so much live coding as it is uh, just demonstrating code um, because none of this would actually work. So, um, the, actually, before I go through the code, I'll show you what you actually get. So, if I do the run, um, so that second command I had there, then I can just go localhost 9000, hit the root path, and there. It's a simple HTTP server running on my local machine. I didn't have to do any configuration. I didn't have to do anything. Um, it's pretty straightforward. This, obviously, is not... It's meant for a more generic like HTTP website use case rather than just uh, an API, but we can use it for what we need. Um, so looking at the code that actually gets built with that you know new project skeleton, uh, you're effectively let's start in the routes file here. It effectively just sets up well two routes, but we only care about the top one here. It sets up the root path root, which is just slash. Oh, yeah, the gray comes through all right, um, and it maps that to this index controller here. Uh, sorry, index action in the application controller. Looking at the actual code, um, who here has worked with Scala before? I assume not many of you. Yeah, just a few. So first of all, yes, this is all in Scala, but I've tried to keep it to the bare minimum, try and keep it accessible. Let your imaginations go wild with what you might not understand. Um, <laughs> should be straightforward. Um, let's see. So, so what we're doing here is this object, uh, you can effectively think of it as like a singleton. Um, it's just a module, but that's how we define a, an, uh, sorry, a, contr a controller, and then by extending the controller one. And then we implement a method here, which is the index action. Um, so yeah, combining those two, or the roots file and this file, we basically get everything we need to do a simple HTML response uh, that says your application is ready. Great. So that's it uh, that I think we I want to cover. I will also mention there's this co configuration file that comes out of the box. Uh, none of this matters. It's just got some like logging configuration by default, but that we will be using that a little bit later. Okay. So uh, all right. So actually designing our API. So let's get into it. So to to build this feature, remember we're favoriting, or a user is getting the ability to favor a studio. Um, I wanted to do that with four endpoints uh, on our API, right? So we're going to have the first is the path sort of if you post to users slash that u some user ID slash favorite studio slash studio ID, uh, that's going to wow this is sorry. Somewhat inconvenient. Uh, I just got to turn off my Wi-Fi here. <laughs> All right. So, I guess what what I'm using as the concept for this API design is that the favorite is an object. Either that object exists if a user has favorited a studio, or it doesn't exist. So, to create a favorite, to mark something as favorited, you post to this endpoint. To unfavorite something you delete that object, right? You send an HTTP delete command um, to that endpoint. And to see everything that a user has favorited, well, down here we can just do a get request to the generic favorite studios collections endpoint. And to see if a specific studio is favorited, we'll just allow you to do a get request to that studio ID specifically, uh, which will return either 200 OK if the favorite does exist, or 404 not found if it doesn't. Um, if any of you are like really into REST APIs and disagree with this, I'll be happy to talk about it later. 
Um, but I think this is great API design <laughs> um, <laughs> for the problem. Um, okay, so what's the first step? Well, first I'm going to focus on just that first endpoint where we're, we're doing a post request uh, to mark something as favorited. That's what I'll focus on for the first few minutes of this. Um, and to do that, to get started, it's two steps. The first is we just define, well, I'm defining an entirely new controller here. I'm not going to use the out-of-the-box applications one. We don't need to. That's just a sample. Um, so I'm creating a new controller called Favorite Studios, which will handle everything under that Favorite Studios sort of endpoint path there. Um, and then specifically an add action, which takes a user ID and a studio ID. Um, and then I'm going to add a corresponding route to the routes file. Uh, this is all supposed to be on one line. It just obviously doesn't fit. Um, and so what I'm saying is if someone posts to that path that we just described, map it with the parameters to that add it action. Um, what's nice feature here of the play framework is that I get to specify the, the type in specific right here. Um, and what that means is that the play framework will actually handle making sure that I received an integer value in my in my path if they try and produce a uh, add, you know, some sort of alphabetical character, um, play will take care of returning a 400 bad request uh, or whatever the appropriate response is. Okay, and before I can demo that, I have to go just slightly one step further and talk a bit about JSON. So my actual re response here when someone like hits this endpoint with a post command is that I want to return a JSON version of the object that we've created, that favorites object. So to do that, I'm going to define a model, uh, which is very simple, right? It's just going to be a, a favorite model and it's going to have two parameters, the user ID and the studio ID. And then I'm going to implement what's called a rights combinator. And this is a concept, uh, I believe, uh, specific to the play JSON. Um, at least this implementation of it is specific to the play JSON library, but that's the one I'm going to be using here. And I won't get into it in too much detail. I always have to check the docs when I want to implement one of these, and I recommend you do the same. But basically what it's doing is you're defining this con um, translator, I'll call it, a transformer, sorry, um, that basically returns a writes of that favorite studio model type. And it does that by mapping um, the user ID and studio ID fields in JSON to that model class. Um, if you want to talk more about that later, you can feel free to ask questions. Uh, but yeah, so let's show you these two things tied together in exactly all the details there. All right, so not that one. There we go. Nope, not even that one. There we go. Uh, so let's start over a bit again. So looking at the new routes file, you can see that I've added this post with the mapping from our path to this new action. Uh, what I didn't show you in the slides there was this favorite studios model class. So here it's a case class in um, Scala. All that means is it's a special type of class where the two properties I define are ordered and publicly available. Uh, the reason I say ordered is because the way up here, this is that uh, JSON rights combinator I was talking about. What happens is when I do this unapply, it basically does the mapping of these properties to these JSON uh, output properties uh, just by the ordering of the parameters. So it's saying the first one, user ID, will map to this user ID. I'm using the same names for everything for consistency. Um, okay, so that's the rights combinator, which lives inside of a companion object to my model, just as detail there. Um, and then looking at the actual action, so what happens now is if someone calls that endpoint, it's going to get routed to this action, which takes us the user ID and the studio ID. And then we're just creating uh, an instance of that model class, Scala with case classes, you don't need the new keyword, but that is just creating an instance of it, um, with the user ID and studio ID. By an implicit conversion, it just auto-magically uses that uh, rights combinator to convert this to a JSON value. And then that's what we're outputting uh, with a 200 OK response. So to show that this works, makes sense. Uh, let me just run it quickly here. Just occurred to me I forgot to do some setup, so ignore what I do for the next two seconds. That should work fine. Um, OK, so my code's running, so I'm just going to do a quick curl here. to localhost, it's running on 9,000, so I can go users. At this point, I can give it an arbitrary user ID. You know, I'm not checking any of that stuff. Um, I won't be today. You can assume that that's all handled like by your front end or something to validate that that's a legitimate user. Um, and a studio ID. And if I run that, I should get 
Yes. So curl just responds with um, simple JSON. It's not prettified. There's no new line. Forgive me. Uh, that would require more lines of code, and I don't want to do it. Um, so yeah, simply returning an object. Um, if I maybe just for clarity do that with a verbose flag, you can see it's returning uh, a 200 OK, and that's probably the only part that matters. All right. So that's it uh, for that part. Let's see here. All right. So yeah, the important part of that was we're just taking the input and we're returning it as output. Not particularly helpful. Let's actually persist the data, right? So how hard is it to start persisting to MySQL with uh, play? Well, it shifts with a great uh, library called Anorm. And there's just a couple steps to actually getting that working. First is going back to that configuration file that I showed you at the beginning and putting in a simple MySQL configuration. Um, so here, you know, you're just asking for the driver. We're specifying the JDBC MySQL driver. That's Java E stuff if you're not too familiar with it. Um, and then standard, you've got server location, port. Uh, you specify the database at the end of the path, a user, and a password. All right, anyone who's worked with MySQL should understand this or any other database for that matter. This isn't actually in our code base, but I just wanted to clearly communicate the table that we're interacting with. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's called Favorite Studio to match what we're doing. Um, it just has two uh, columns, user ID and primary studio ID. And what's interesting here is the primary key, I actually built it on the combination of those two columns because we wouldn't want duplicates. And this actually will come in a bit handier later. Uh, because something I didn't necessarily say at the beginning was each of those API endpoints I wrote, I'm actually going to design this and just keep them item potent. So, you know, if you want to handle like failure cases, whatever, you can just hit them multiple times. Um, yeah, and they'll be item potent. So that'll help us uh, achieve that later. And right. And so then the final part is I like to um, just sort of constrain all my data outputs to, or any external system rights uh, to a data access layer. And so here I'm writing a data access object. That's what the DAO there in the object name stands for. Um, and at this point, it's just got a single create method. Um, now, if you recall what I said earlier, for those of you not familiar with Scala, the object is like a singleton. Um, what that means is any method you implement in there is effectively a static method. So that's why this is taking um, an object as input. It's not actually returning anything in this case. Um, because I'm being very optimistic, either it works or it throws an exception is kind of the theory with this design in my DAO. Um, I'm also not really handling failures for this demo. <laughs> Good practice. Um, but yeah, so you import this DB object, and I'll show you the code in a bit more detail with the imports and everything, um, but wouldn't fit on the slides. So you have this DB object, and you can just say with connect, uh, connection, and then define a, uh, an expression. And in this case, what happens, we, we leverage Scala's implicit keyword here and get the connection object, but then we never actually have to use it. Uh, everything is designed to just sort of, well, use it implicitly. Um, so you define your SQL here. I'm not even going to bother explaining that other than to say the ignore comes back to what I was uh, trying to discuss about the primary key there and item potency. So what this says is it'll try to insert it. If it already exists for that user ID and studio ID, just ignores it. Um, it won't blow up or anything. And uh, but then you just avoid multiple records. And here we're using parameter values. So they're named parameters here, uh, which is particularly helpful. Um, and then you just call. So once you create that SQL sort of container object, you can just call execute insert. And then it actually performs the operation. Um, pretty straightforward there. Uh, so yeah, let's see that in action. Um, So going back to the beginning, uh, I don't no, I haven't changed anything in the routes file from what I showed you. So the only things that changed are actually I'll start in the. So I said I'd show you the DAO model with the imports. So basically, you import a norm dot underscore. That's just kind of everything. It's a lot of helper functions, and then specifically we import this instance of the DB. It effectively represents the database configuration tied in with a norm um, that is just reading yeah, out of our config file, and that's basically the only imports that are relevant here. So to show you, yeah, the configuration's in there, uh, more or less exactly as I showed you. I just changed some values. So once I've built this create, you know, DAO uh, method, I actually put that into my model, although not in the most m way that makes the most sense. Um, but yeah, so in my companion object for my model, I just added another static method, add favorite, which takes the user ID and studio ID. It produces that model object out of it, 
passes it into the data access layer and then just returns it optimistically. Again, the assumption being that if something goes wrong in the SQL, it's actually going to bl blow up with an exception on this line and be handled by something higher up. Um, but that, because everything's item potent, that really shouldn't happen except in an exceptional case. So it's probably an okay way to handle it from a simplistic point of view. Um, and then going back to the uh, to my controller and my action, so I've just sort of changed the logic here a bit. So now I'm calling that add favorite on the model, uh, getting back the object, and that's what we're returning, right? So to demonstrate, uh, this should be an active connection if it's still working to my uh, database, which let's find out if that worked. That's what I was trying to start up here. Uh, looks like it should have worked. Yeah, OK, sorry. So the refresh just took a minute there. Uh, it's just the table that I described earlier, but it's empty, right? Ooh. Anyone want to guess what this demo is going to show? Um, so if I do the request, oh, I haven't actually started my application. That's why. Let's start this version of it. There we go. So that's running. Pretty fast startup time, right? Uh, OK. So let's just try that again. So I run the application, returns with a 200 OK. The same result as last time. No surprises here. Only difference being, as you might expect, now the result is in um, MySQL. So that's persisted. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to run that just one more time with a slightly different studio ID. Right? OK. And I should have two. Great. OK. So that's the first bit. But what good is being able to post without actually being able to retrieve the information? So without any more slides, I'll just quickly show you my expanded version where I effectively just repeated those steps. I defined an action in the controller. I defined uh, you know, appropriate methods in the data access layer and in the model. And I defined the additional routes um, for the remaining endpoints that I was talking about. So you've got delete, you've got get, uh, get all, and check for a specific one. Um, so the routes file grows a bit. Again, doesn't really fit on the screen. But you can just tell there's a simple mapping to various actions, right? Um, again, going into our controller, we've got the actions for each. They're more or less just as simple. Uh, one I want to dig into is on the find. So this is where I'm trying to figure out if a single um, instance of you know, that favorite exists or not. We do the find um, using the model, and I'll go over that in a minute. But basically what that does, that returns an option of a favorite. So that would you know, more or less look like option favorite studio. And so what an option does is it has a value that's either some and then an instance of the type or none, uh, which is just sort of like a singleton instance. And so that just lets me decide, you know, it's kind of like working with a Boolean, but it's much cleaner. And it also includes a reference to the object if it's found. So what I do is I can do a uh, pattern match on that. OK. And did I find none? In that case, I can return a not found response um, with an appropriate error or some. And I get the the instance of the favorite, and then I can return in 200 OK with the JSON for that. So that's a nice little helper leveraging uh, options, um, which are a great feature of Scala. Uh, other than that, nothing else in this file worth going over. Um, jumping into that model quickly, you can see that I just did a really plain job for the most part of wrapping my data access layer. In this case, that's probably you know a good level of abstraction to keep in there anyway, because chances are these things will get more in complex, and they will in a minute when I start introducing actors. Um, but for the most part, yeah, just a nice little bit of extraction. This is where, so my actual database query, I'm using this exists in the data access layer, which returns a Boolean. And then based on that, I either return some with an instance of the favorite that I build here or none. Um, just sort of explaining how that passes through. And then as you might exi expect in the data access object, um, we've just repeated the same pattern. The only thing that changes here is, well, obviously the SQL query, right, if I want to run a delete. But also, at the end of where I was cr doing the inserts, I execute insert. Here I execute update. And then uh, with the get, with the selects, it goes a little bit differently. And so with the exists, this is where I'm trying to return a Boolean of does it just exist in the database or not. So here I've opted to do a count. Um, and then you call the apply to sort of execute that and it returns a value. And then uh, what it returns is a, a stream of rows. And with a count, you only get one. So we just get the head one. And it's either going to be a value of one or zero, right? If it exists, it counts one. If it doesn't, it counts a zero. And so we just do, obviously, the Boolean comparison there. And that's what we return. Um, 
with the index where we're trying to get all of the favorites, it gets a little different. So I've implemented this method here, which returns a list of those favorite objects. Um, again, just a normal select, that's straightforward. We run the apply, and like I said, that returns a stream of uh, database row results, um, or result rows, whatever you want to call it. Um, so what we do is we take that return, returning stream, and we map over it. Um, Matthew uh, explained how maps work a little earlier, so hopefully you remember that. Uh, um, all we're doing is we're basically transforming each element using this, um, sorry, <laughs> blanking here, but basically using this rule. Um, and so what it does, it takes the row, it extracts the user ID column, the studio ID column value, and it creates one of these favorites. So what we've done is that map effectively goes from a stream of SQL rows to a stream of these objects. Because it's a stream, we force it to read to the end, and then we convert that to a list, which is just you know uh, a collection in Scala, kind of like maybe where you'd use an array in most other languages. Um, all right, so that's it for the data access layer. Um, I already talked about the actions, so we can just see those in action. Uh, yeah, see those in action. Um, run that one, and then so now using the same table where we persisted our data. The data is, in fact, still there. So let's just curl. And this time, I'm going to just read all for our particular user. Take that user ID. Um, and if I do that, I should get just a, yeah, you can kind of, again, have to parse it. But we get a result that's an array of two favorites, the two that we have in our data store. Um, now what I might do is pick one of those. I'll pick that one there. And I can do the get. I'll do it with the verbose flag this time. So this, I'm just checking if a favorite exists. That was the other endpoint we wanted. And you see here that we get the 200 OK result and that specific studio's details, or that favorite's details. Um, and now I want to be able to mark that as unfavorited by deleting that object. We delete it. Uh, we get the 200 OK there. So theoretically, if I go back and try and run that list request, it doesn't include it anymore. And likewise, if I try and get that specific favorite, now I get a 404 not found as expected. Um, the content is just an appropriate error. Um, OK, so that's all of my endpoints implemented, uh, persisted, pretty straightforward. So briefly, uh, I can't really demo this next part, which is regarding caching very well here because everything is running locally. It is actually really fast. Um, if I introduce caching, it doesn't actually get any faster uh, in this case. Uh, but if you wanted to do caching, a uh, nice part of this, and this is a great benefit of using a microservice, is that your interface is really simple. You know everything's going through that API to consume or submit data, so you know where all your entry and exit points are for your data, which makes caching really easy, right? Because the two sides of caching are well, caching the right at the right points so that you don't have to hit the so that you don't have to read from you know your data store anytime unnecessarily, um, but also cache and validation is always a hard part, and that's really easy in this case. So the actual line relevant to caching is I just wrap my action implementation with this cached expression. Uh, really, it's a it's a function call. Um, so yeah, cached it's part of the play uh, framework or one of the dependencies it includes. And all I'm providing there is a cache key, which I just generate uh, unique to this endpoint, but then based on the user ID and the studio ID. So that cache is a result. Um, and I'll go through cache and validation in a second. It's only a couple more lines of code. But oh, that's all I have for that one. OK, so yeah, let's take a look at that uh, code in a bit more detail. So all my caching code lives in my controller doesn't leak out. I don't have to worry about it anywhere else. I am caching on the service. You know, Obviously, this is much more simplified. If you had to use something like memcache separately, logic should be similar. But honestly, if you have a well-scoped microservice, I feel like caching on the instance is generally a reasonable thing to do. Um, OK, so as I mentioned, uh, the cache, you can see it here now. I've just wrapped both of the read endpoints with their own little cache things. And then I've implemented this clear caches method to help out. And all that does is it generates you know, the two predictable um, cache keys when a change is made, because that change will affect the user in a studio. 
and then it just removes them both, you know, clears them out of the cache. So anytime I delete one, I clear the cache is relevant to that. Anytime I read one, I clear the cache is relevant to that. And it just works. Um, like I said, I could run the demo, I would just be doing what I just did, and the time doesn't change. So, uh, but you can imagine it would be much more noticeable if you had an external database with like a 300 millisecond delay. The caching can be quite helpful. Um, okay, so going back to the slides. Uh, <coughs> actors. So that was it. I mean, that theoretically in and of itself is a microservice. It does something that has, you know, a scope of concern, right? It's only worrying about managing the data for these favorites. Any other part of my application, you know, that monolith or whatever, any other applications, they can just use that service. It's like, hey, somebody favorited something. Mark that um, through the API. And then if I ever need to update, add information to how that feature works or anything, I can do it scoped within that microservice and just deploy the microservice. And it changes to the application shouldn't affect the microservice. So you've decoupled, you're benefiting in terms of reliability and everything else. All right, but I did want to show you actors, so I made up and you know web services later on. So I made up this like artificial extension to our use case, and the idea here is simply okay. A user favorites something, cool. What's what's the business business benefit to that? Well, this gives us an excuse to tell all their friends about it. So what I want to do is every time a user favorites a studio, I'm going to go look up all of their friends, and then send each of them a push notification, right? Uh, as you can imagine, that's not a very fast task necessarily. Um, you're reading from an external web service. You're probably pushing to another external service like Amazon SNS, which is totally outside your, you know, your grid. So that those are going to be slow operations. We don't necessarily want to do those and make the user who made the request wait for the response. This is, you know, when you write your first kind of PHP app, if that's how you learned like me. Um, it's just kind of something you do, right? It's like you handle every transformation and whatever in the main thread and the user was waiting for the response and you know eventually get back to it. There's lots of ways of handling this. We all probably write slightly better code than that at this point, um, but actors are a great way of handling that. Um, and I'm just touching on them very briefly here. They're a lot more powerful than this. Um, but the idea is, is you define an actor object and, or sorry, uh, an actor uh, class and an instance of that just sort of runs on a separate thread continuously. And the idea with an actor, and I don't have a diagram for this, I guess, but the idea with an actor is at any point in your code, you just send it a message, and then asynchronously on its own thread, it processes that message and performs any action necessary, right? So the important part here is I'm defining this actor here, which extends actor, which is part of the uh, actor framework, which just came as part of our template. And the only method you have to implement is this receive. And so what this is doing is it's saying, so I guess I, I mentioned they're sending a message. What the message actually is, at least in the case of Acta, uh, is just instances of these case classes, uh, or really any object, I suppose. Um, and so what it's saying is if it receives a message which is one of these favorite model objects, then it's just going to perform some task with it, which we'll get into the details of later. Um, you do generally want to do this sort of companion object where you get the properties of an actor, and that helps the... Uh, there's actually an actor management system, which, you know, will spin up one instance of this, uh, in our case anyway, one instance of this, and it'll manage it and keep it alive. If it ever crashes, it just respins it. These are all benefits of an actor system that I'm not covering in this talk. Um, but the point is, yeah, you know, with these two, you've effect these two method implementations, you've effectively implemented an actor. Uh, doesn't do anything yet, but you've got one. Uh, and then the next part, as I said, is sending in a message. So we're going back to my add favorite. Um, definition here, function definition, in our model sort of layer. And what it does is, you saw most of this code before, it creates an instance of that favorite model. It sends it to the data access layer to be persisted to MySQL. And then it sends, now it's sending it an instance of it uh, as a message to the actor before returning it. Uh, this bang here is basically just your send message to actor um, syntax. So, the important part here is we send this off to the actor, but then we immediately continue, right? Once that message is sent, ACA takes care of the rest concurrently, right? It's out of scope for our main workflow here. The user isn't waiting on that. Um, before I can demo this, I want to, yeah, definitely go through the web services part and tie them together at the end. Um, so yeah, the web service part, where does that play in here? Well, 
First of all, it's, uh, there are tools that ship with Play that just let you easily consume HTTP uh, REST APIs like the one we're building. So obviously you'd use that if you want to compound these microservices. Or in this case, we can even pretend that we're just reading back from that existing monolithic application, but through an API that it exposes. Um, it just lets you really easily consume those web services. Uh, in this case, we're going to read the friend data about friends of this particular user uh, and then process it so we can send out the push notifications. So uh, before I start going through these slides, I want to show you, just show you what that service is. I have it up and running here. Um, oops, Ooh, that's the wrong key. There we go. So yeah, it's running. Um, that was unnecessary, localhost. Right. So all it does is it has one endpoint, which is slash friends, and it takes the user ID as a query parameter. I hit that, and it's going to return me um, a list of that user's friends in, in JSON, right? That's it. Um, pretty straightforward. I can put any friend ID in here that I want, and I'll get a list. They always seem to have five friends. I don't know what it is. Um, also, for demonstrative purposes, I've introduced an artificial uh, three-second lag here. Uh, because that's what you'd expect. You hit a web service, it's going to be slow. Maybe not that slow, but it's going to be slow. Um, and so, if I yeah, so it just keeps working, but there is that three second delay. That'll play in a bit later. So that's the web service that we're consuming data out of. Uh, going back to the slides here. All right, so how do you read from one of these HTTP web services? Well, uh, starting out, so this is a whole new method I've defined. It's actually in a different uh, data access layer class that I've defined. You'll see that when I go back to the code again. Um, but basically, just an index function here, which is saying for any user ID, return a list of their friends. What it is using, again, is a future of a list of those friends is what it's returning. And so if you work with JavaScript, you're familiar with promises. Uh, basically, something that it just promises that it'll exist at some point in the future. Hold on little different from a promise, which Scala also has, but let's not get into that. Um, but yeah, so the idea is we create the sort of request holder, which is essentially just like, I don't know, a URL builder, right? And so we initialize that by providing it a URL for that web service. I've got this defined elsewhere. Um, just a simple URL. Then we say with query string, and we give it that one parameter, right? User ID, and then the user ID that we're passing into the function here. Then with get performs a get request, right? That's straightforward. And then what this is where futures get introduced. So that command returns a future of a response. And so all we're saying is, okay, when we get that response, again, using map in this case, when we get that response, let's uh, basically parse out the list of friends. So first it's parsing out, well, the list of friend IDs. And then for each one of those friend IDs, we're converting that collection, turning those into instances of this friend, which is another model object I've defined um, off this slide. All right, so let's go through the code in a bit more detail. Um, and let's start with, uh, well, those models that I said I defined but hadn't shown you. So, it's, well, it's really just this friend one at this point. Um, so we've got this friend case class. It just contains a friend ID. It's just a little container here. Um, actually, could do that a little better. And then in our companion object, I'm just defining this find all friends helper. So find all friends for a particular user. It calls that data access layer object that we just saw. Um, and yeah, there's some other details here. Um, but yeah, so it calls that with the user ID. Now I said that I'd define the friend service URL somewhere else. Uh, that's actually up here. So what we're doing is we're reading a custom configuration out of the configuration file, um, which I've just identified as service backend URL, and then appending the friends endpoint because that's where we get our friend data from. As I said, we build that URL, we append the query string, we do the get request, and then we map the results. Uh, it's changed slightly from what was in the slide, but still works. Um, but yeah, we get the result from that endpoint, and we end up returning a future, as specified up here, a future of a list of friends. Um, okay, we'll be using that in a minute. So, <coughs> tying that together, uh, still nothing has changed in our controller or actions, as far as I can recall. Um, but this is the full, ex so we did go through the definition of the actor already, uh, but this is slightly expanded now. So first of all, the relevant imports, you just import some ACA stuff. Um, that is all sort of included with the um, play skeleton. Uh, nothing else up there matters. And then, when we, so when we receive, so remember, 
when we created an instance of one of these favorites, we sent that message to the actor. That, on a separate thread concurrently, will be received by this receive call. It'll recognize it as one of those favorite model objects and call this helper function. And what that's doing is it's taking that favorite and it's calling that find all friends, which is then hitting that external web service, getting the IDs for all of those friends, creating a list of those um, friend, yeah, creating a list of those friend objects, uh, model objects, and then returning a future to that because that's all also ha happening asynchronously. So to iterate over that, we can use the Scala for comprehension. Um, and what this is doing, I'll just walk you through it. Um, basically, it's saying when that future resolves, give us the list of friends, the collection of friends. Um, and then for each element in that collection of friends, give us the individual friend. Now we're creating, an, and then just with that, we're creating a new instance of another helper model method here, uh, favorite notification, which just takes a friend and the favorite that we were working with originally. And then for each of those, we're sending. Um, and just to peek into that super quickly, uh, simpler helper class uh, takes a friend and a favorite, and then instead of actually sending to Amazon SNS because no network, reliable network, uh, I'm just going to print out a line that says, you know, send push notification. But you can imagine that that's happening. And uh, so, I mean, that should effectively be tying everything together. Um, all this only plays in when I create one of these favorite objects. So let's see that quickly. Uh, let's run this quickly. So, all right, got that running. Just clear up my screen a bit here. No, oh, that didn't work. There we go. So if I create one of these, uh, it'll be important to watch the console at the bottom here, because that's where those like sent notifications are going to go out. But basically, what you're going to see is I'm going to run this. It's going to return more or less immediately with the JSON payload. And then a few seconds later, in this console down at the bottom, you'll see it print out sending push notifications once we've hit that external web service. Um, so it returns first, but then concurrently, we're hitting that web service with the three second delay. And then it's sending out the push notifications concurrently without affecting our consumer's experience. Um, so we're still getting things done. And so that's a great um, example of where a microservice, again, so somewhat beneficial from a design perspective. The idea of sending a push notification whenever something is favorited, that doesn't need to go, my app doesn't even necessarily need to be aware of that, right? That's scoped within the microservice logic, um, and we can handle that in there. And so, um, you know, to put out that change, I'm just pushing out a deploy of this microservice, again, not at all affecting my main service, uh, my main application. Um, all right. so. Bringing that together, uh, we covered building a quick HTTP REST API, um, handling JSON, both consuming uh, from that web, consuming the JSON from that web service, and also producing it for our output. Uh, persisting data MySQL, leveraging the enorm library there, caching in just a couple lines, which was pretty awesome. I always like that. Uh, a really brief introduction to ACT actors. If you're not familiar with actor frame, uh, actor models or any of that stuff, look into it. It'll change your life. Uh, and then, yeah, we consume some web services pretty s easily. So if you found this interesting, you want to read a bit more about it, uh, microservices in general, Martin Fowler uh, has a great blog post about it. I forgot to mention there's a link in the bottom that is the link to these slides on the internet. And if you go to that, it works on your phone, it's awesome, um, you can click on any of these links and actually go. Uh, if you want to learn about more about building like a REST API or something like that microservice with Play, a uh, former coworker of mine, Seba Alhilo, she wrote a blog post on our code blog. Uh, that I think covered it pretty well. So that's it for me. Thank you.